false faith, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Faith is the key. Faith is a key doctrine in the Christian life. The sinner is saved by faith, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. And the believer must walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, Hebrews 6, verse 11. And whatever we do apart from faith is sin, Romans 14 through 23. Someone has said that faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequence. When you read Hebrews chapter 11, you meet men and women who acted on God's word, no matter what price they had to pay. Faith is not some kind of nebulous feeling that we work up. Faith is confidence that God's word is true and conviction that acting on that word will bring his blessing. In this paragraph, James discussed the relationship between faith and works. This is an important discussion for if we believe we are wrong, for if we are wrong in this matter, we jeopardize our eternal salvation. This is a serious issue. What kind of faith really saves a person? Is it necessary to perform good works in order to be saved? How can a person tell whether or not he is experiencing true saving faith? James answered these questions by explaining to us that there are three kinds of faith, only one of which is true saving faith. In chapters 2, verses 14 through 17, we'll talk about dead faith. Even in the early church, there were some who claimed they had saving faith, yet they did not possess salvation. Wherever there is the true, you will find the counterfeit. Jesus warned us, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven, Matthew 7, verse 21. People with dead faith substitute words for deeds. They know the correct vocabulary for prayer and testimony and can even quote the right verses from the Bible, but their walk does not measure up to their talk. So they think that their words are as good as works, and they are wrong. James gave a simple illustration. A poor believer came into a fellowship without proper clothing and in need of food. And the person with dead faith noticed the visitor and saw his needs, but he did not do anything to meet the needs. All he did was say a few pious words. Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed. James 2, verse 16. But the visitor went away just as hungry and just as naked as he came in. Food and clothing are basic needs of every human being, whether he is saved or unsaved. And having food and raiment, let us be therefore content, it says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 8. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For your heavenly Father knows that ye have need of these things. Matthew six thirty one and 32. Jacob included these basic needs in his prayer to God. If God will be with me, and will give me bread to eat, and raiment to put on. Genesis twenty eight twenty. As believers, we have an obligation to help meet the needs of people, no matter who they might be. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6 and 10. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of these, one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Matthew 25 verse 40. To help a person in need is an expression of love, and faith works by love. Galatians 5, chapter, uh, verse 6. The Apostle John emphasized this aspect of good works. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. 1 John three seventeen verse 18. 
the priest and the Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan each had religious training, but neither of them paused to assist the dying man at the side of the road. Luke 10, 25 through 37. Each of them would defend his faith, yet neither demonstrated that faith in loving works. The question in James 2, 14 should read, can that kind of faith save him? What kind? The kind of faith that is never seen in practical works. The answer is no, it cannot. Any declaration of faith that does not result in a changed life and good works is a false declaration. That kind of faith is dead faith. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone, James 2, verse 17. The great theologian John Calvin wrote, It is faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies can never be alone. The word alone in James 2.17 simply means by itself. True saving faith can never be by itself. It always brings life, and life produces good works. The person with dead faith has only an intellectual experience, and in his mind he knows the doctrines of salvation, but he has never submitted himself to God and trusted Christ for salvation. He knows the right words, but he does not back up his words with his works. Faith in Christ brings life, John 3.16. And where there is life, there must be growth and there must be fruit. Three times in this paragraph, James warned us that faith without works is dead. James 2, verse 17, verse 20, and verse 26. Beware of a mere intellectual faith. No man can come to Christ by faith and remain the same any more than he can come in contact with a 220-volt wire and remain the same. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. 1 John 5 and 12. Dead faith is not saving faith. Dead faith is counterfeit faith. And it lulls the person into a false confidence of eternal life. Chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. James wanted to shock his complacent readers, so he used demons as his illustration. In recent years, the church has rediscovered the reality and the activity of demons in the earth. When our Lord was ministering on earth, he often cast out demons and he gave that power to his disciples. Paul often confronted demonic forces in his ministry and in Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 20, he admonished the early Christians to claim God's protection and to defeat the spiritual forces of wickedness. It comes as a shock to people that demons have faith. What do they believe? For one thing, they believe in the existence of God. They are neither atheists nor agnostics. They also believe in the deity of Christ. Whenever, we, whenever they met Christ, when he was on earth, they bore witness to his sonship. Mark 3, 11 and 12. They believe in the existence of a place of punishment, Luke 8 and 3. And they also recognize that Jesus Christ as the judge, he is the judge. Mark 5, verses 1 through 13. They submit to the power of his word. Hear, hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. This was a daily affirmation of faith of the godly Jew. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the de demons believe that and shudder. James 2 verse 19. The man with dead faith was touched only in his intellect, but the demons are touched also in their emotions. They believe and they tremble. But it is not a saving experience to believe and tremble. A person can be enlightened in his mind and even stirred in his heart and be lost forever. True saving faith involves something more, something that can be seen and something that can be recognized, a changed life. Show me thy faith without thy works. 
challenge James. And I will show you my faith by my works. James 2, verse 18. How could a person show his faith without works? Can a dead sinner perform good works? Impossible. When you trust Christ, you are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2 and 10. Being a Christian involves trusting Christ and living for Christ. You receive the life. Then you receive the life or reveal the life. Let me say that again because I messed it up. Being a Christian involves trusting Christ and living for Christ. You receive the life. Then you reveal the life. Faith that is barren is not saving faith. The Greek word translated dead in James 2.20 carries the meaning of barren or idle, like money drawing no interest. James has introduced us to two kinds of faith that can save the sinner. Dead faith, the intellect alone, and demonic faith, the intellect and the emotions. He closes this section by describing the only kind of faith that can save the sinner, dynamic faith. Chapter two, uh, 2, verses 20 through 26. Dynamic faith is faith, faith that is real. Faith that has power. Faith that results in a changed life. James described this true saving faith. To begin with, a, a dynamic saving faith is based on the word of God. We receive our spiritual rebirth through God's word. James 1, verse eight, 18. We receive the word, and this saves us, James 1, 21. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. James used Abraham, and he used Rahab as illustrations of dynamic saving faith, since both of them heard, and they received the message of God through his word. Faith is only as good as its object. The man in the jungle bows before an idol of stone and trusts it to help him, but he receives no help. No matter how much faith a person may generate, it is not directed at the right object. It will accomplish nothing. I believe, quote, I believe may be the testimony of many sincere people, but the big question is, in whom do you believe? What do you believe? We're not saved by faith in faith. We are saved by faith in Christ as revealed in his word. Dynamic faith is based on God's word, and it involves the whole man. Dead faith touches only the intellect. Demonic faith involves both the mind and the emotions. But dynamic faith involves the will. The whole person plays a part in true saving faith. The mind understands the truth, the heart desires the truth, and the will acts upon the truth. The men and women of faith named in Hebrews 11 were people of action. God spoke and they obeyed. Again, again, faith is not believing in spite of evidence. Faith is obeying in spite of consequence. True saving faith leads to action. Dynamic faith is not intellectual contemplation or emotional consternation. It leads to obedience on the part of the will. And this obedience is not an isolated event. It continues throughout the, the whole life. It leads to works. Many different kinds of works are named in the New Testament. In Galatians 2.16, there's the works of the law. Relate to the sinner's attempt to please God by obeying the law of Moses. And of course, it is impossible for a sinner to be saved through the works of the law. The works of the flesh, Galatians 5.19, are done by unsaved people who live for the things of the old nature. There are also wicked works, Colossians 1.21, and there are dead works, Hebrews 9 and 14. Where there is dynamic faith, there is saving faith. 
You will always find good works. James then illustrated his, his doctrine in the lives of two well-known Bible persons, Abraham and Rahab. You could not find two more different persons. Abraham was a Jew. Rahab was a Gentile. Abraham was a godly man, but Rahab was a sinful woman, a harlot. Abraham was a friend of God, while Rahab belonged to the enemies of God. So what did they have in common? Both of them exercised saving faith in God. You will want to read uh, Genesis 15 and Genesis 22 to get the background, to get the facts for this illustration. God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees to lead him into Canaan and to make out of him the great nation of Israel. It was through Israel that God would bring the Savior into the world. Abraham's salvation experience is recorded in Genesis 15. At night, God showed his servant the stars and gave him a promise. So shall thy seed or thy descendants be. So how did Abraham respond? The Bible says in Genesis 15, 5 and 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, counted it to him for righteousness. So the word counted is a legal or financial term. It means to put to one's account. The word counted is a legal or financial term. It means to put to one's account. As a sinner, Abraham's spiritual bank book was empty. He was bankrupt, but he trusted God. And God put righteousness and God put righteous on Abraham's account. Abraham did not work for his righteousness. He received it as a gift from God. He was declared righteous by faith. He was justified by faith. Read Romans 4. Justification is an important doctrine in the Bible. Justification is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous on the basis of Christ's finished work on the cross. It is not a process. It's an act. It is not something the sinner does. It is something God does for the sinner when he trusts Christ. It is once for all event. It never changes. How can you tell if a person is justified by faith if this transaction takes place between the sinner and God privately? Abraham's example answers that important question. The justified person has a changed life and obeys God's will. His faith is demonstrated by his works. James used another event in Abraham's life, an event that took place many years after Abraham's conversion. And this event is the offering up of Isaac on the altar, Genesis 22. Abraham was not saved by obeying God's difficult command. His obedience provided, his obedience proved that he already was saved. You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. James 2, verse 22. There is a perfect relationship between faith and works. As, as someone has expressed it, Abraham was not saved by faith plus works, but by faith that works. He was Abraham. How was Abraham justified by works? James 2.21. When he had already been justified by faith. See Romans 4. By faith he was justified before God and his righteousness declared. By works he was justified before men and his righteousness demonstrated. It is true that no humans actually saw Abraham put his son on the altar, but the inspired record in Genesis 22 enables us to see the event and witness Abraham's demonstrated, Abraham's faith demonstrated by his works. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. This exhortation, church members today who fit the 
description given in Titus. Titus 1 and 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Titus 1, 16. Paul also wrote, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Titus 3 and 8. His second illustration is Rahab, and the background to her is found in Joshua 2 and Joshua 6. Israel was about to invade their promised land and to take the city of Jericho. Joshua sent spies into the city to get the lay of the land. There they met Rahab, a harlot, who protected them and affirmed that she believed in what God had said and what God was going to do. When the men departed, they promised to save her and her family. And when the city was taken, and this they did. It is an exciting story, but in it is one of the Bible's greatest examples of saving faith. See Hebrews 11, verse 31. Rahab heard the word and knew that her city was condemned. This truth affected her and her fellow citizens, so that their hearts melted within them. Joshua 2.11. Rahab responded with her mind and her emotions, but she also responded with her will. She did something about it. She risked her own life to protect the Jewish spies, and she further risked her life by sharing the good news of deliverance with the members of her family. The Hebrew word translated harlot in Joshua 2 can also have the wider meaning of an innkeeper. Rahab ran a guest house, so it was normal for the spies to go there. The Greek word harlot in James 2.25 definitely means an immoral person. This, also, this is also the meaning in Hebrews 11.31. Matthew 1 and verse 5 indicates she married into Israel and became an actress became an intercessor of our Lord. What grace. Rahab is one of the first soul winners in the Bible, and you cannot help but compare her with the bad Samaritan in John 4. Rahab could have had dead faith. She could have had a mere intellectual experience, or she could have had demonic faith, but her mind enlightened her, and her emotions stirred her. She exercised dynamic faith, and her mind knew the truth. Her heart was stirred by the truth, and her will acted on the truth. She proved her faith by her works. And when you realize the small amount of information that Rahab had, you can see how truly marvelous her faith really was. Today we have the full revelation of God through his word and his son. We live on the other side of Calvary, and we have the Holy Spirit to convict and to teach us the word of God. Luke 12, 48, For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. Her faith is an indictment against the unbelief of sinners today. James 2 emphasized that the mature Christian practices the truth. He does not merely hold an ancient hold two ancient doctrines, he practices those doctrines in his everyday life. His faith is not the dead faith of the intellectuals or the demonic faith of the fallen spirits. It is the dynamic faith of men like Abraham and women like Rahab, faith that changes a life and goes to work for God. It is important that each professing Christian examine his own heart and life and make sure that he possesses true saving faith dynamic faith examine yourselves second corinthians 13 verse 5a examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith prove your own selves satan is the great deceiver and one of his devices is imitation if he can convince a person that counterfeit faith is true faith he has that person in his power. Here are some questions that we can ask ourselves as we examine our hearts. One, was there a time when I honestly received I was a sinner, realized I was a sinner, and admitted this to myself and to God? 
we need to think about this. It's so important. Two, was there a time when my heart stirred me to flee from the wrath to come? Have I ever seriously been alarmed over my sins? Number three, do I truly understand the gospel that Christ died for my sins and rose again? Do I understand and confess that I cannot save myself? Number four, did I sincerely, sincerely repent of my sins and turn from them? Or do I secretly love sin and want to enjoy it? Number five, have I trusted Christ and Christ alone for my salvation? Do I enjoy a living relationship with him through the word and in the spirit? Number six, has there ever been a change in my life? Do I maintain good works or are my works occasional and weak? Do I see and seek to grow in the things of the Lord? Do I see the ways of the Lord as I read the word? Can others tell that I have been with Jesus? Seven, do I have a desire to share Christ with others? Or am I ashamed of him? Do I enjoy the fellowship of God's people? Is worship a delight to me? Number nine, am I ready for the Lord's return? Or will I be ashamed when he comes for me? To be sure, not every Christian has the same personal experience. And there are degrees of sanctification. But for the most, most part, the preceding spiritual inventory can assist a person in determining his true standing before God. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Psalms 139 verses 23 and 24. Amen.